Hi, I'm Jen Shonger from the NJ Ace, and I am ecstatic to be here today with two people from the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Um, so first, I'm going to have Marena K. Giwa Onaimu introduce herself. Marena K. Yes, hi everyone. So you can probably see my avatar of Garnet from Steven Universe. I'm gonna quickly turn on my video for a second. I'm in my restroom trying to beauty up, put on some makeup to be pretty for all of y'all. Um, so until I'm ready for that, I am going to go back um, on um, <laughs> on non-video. But um, essentially this, this webinar is, is something I'm, we're really excited to do. Um, I'm just gonna basically share that we've had this plan for some time, but I had several, I had two webinars prior to this, one of which ran over, so I'm not ready, but we're gonna go with it. Um, I am the Innovation and Digital Communications Director at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, which we often call either AWN or AWN Network for short. I'm an autistic adult um, of color um, and um, involved in you know various different forms of advocacy. I was diagnosed in adulthood after my two youngest children were diagnosed. And so I went all my life not knowing, you know, about my neurology, but knowing I was different. And so it's just really been, you know, it's a passion of mine to try to push for greater understanding, acceptance and inclusion. There's a lot of misconceptions about being autistic, about our lives. And it's, it's just something that's important to me and to our um, network as a whole and our greater community that we want people to, to know what, you know, we really think and what we really are, what our lives are like and not the trajectory that's, given you know um in a doctor's office or by someone who um thinks they know us but does not um well i'm lee wiley mitzke um i'm the community outreach coordinator for our autistic women and non-binary network um i'm an autistic adult i'm the parent of an autistic person also and i also run the ed wiley autism acceptance library in Stanford, washington it's a small community lending library where we amplify the voices of autistic people instead of like the dominant narrative <laughs> of right. like parents. And, so. Wonderful. And I should say also that I am neurotypical. Um, I do parent two girls, one who's neurotypical and one who's autistic. Um, so I am especially so happy to meet both of you um, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to come together um, to talk about Zoom accessibility or any platform that people seem to be using now um, and you know the fatigue that can come along with that and what that does. Um, so uh, Marena Kay, if we start with you and we can see your very cool avatar right now, um, why don't you, do you want to start with telling us um, how you have experienced having to interact you know via these platforms and uh, what have been the challenging parts and are there parts that seem easier in some ways rather than, you know, face to face? Okay, so I'm going to give an analogy to explain kind of the way that I view all of this, the way I've experienced it. Um, there is, um, a, there's some, some years ago, comedian Chris Rock, who has his own problem but I um, still want to quote him because it makes sense for this, this scenario. Um, he was talking about um, political parties and you know, kind of the racial divide and how you know, in the United States, typically the more progressive or liberal party, the Democratic Party is the one that gets much of the vote of the, you know, of the black community and some other communities of color. Whereas there's, you know, it's kind of split in terms of the other party, the Republican party, which is viewed as more conservative. There are um, white people who vote for that party and for the other party. And so there have been a lot of, you know, people who consider themselves, um, I guess, edgy or different, you know, black people who are kind of jumping out and saying, why why can't we go with a more conservative view? Like they, that is more aligned with what we think or our views or our values. And, um, and then, you know, despite the fact that, you know, um, policy and history, you know, current history tells us otherwise. And so um, Chris Rock made a joke and he said, you know, you know, the, I understand that there are a lot, a lot of, of criticisms of the Democratic you know, Party, and many of them are warranted. He said, this is what the Democratic Party is like. They're kind of like that uncle that paid your way through school, you know, paid for your college, but molested you. <laughs> and so I know that's not, as a survivor myself, it's not that I'm trying to make light of this, but it's just a complicated relationship you have between 
someone or something that's really helpful and necessary or gives you something that you need, but also it's kind of schooling you over at the same time, you know, and secretly. So it's kind of like you were in this, this quagmire, this odd space between, you know, you know quote unquote gratitude or, and, um, you know, anger or frustration. And, but either way you're, you're in a situation where you're dependent, yeah. you know? And so that's how I think about a lot of things with regard to, um, the, you know, since the pandemic, um, how the world has gone so digital. For a very long time, many of us in the disability community um, have been wanting digital options for things, um, wanting the ability to, you know, telepath telemedicine and telecommute and um, people being fired, you know, because they requested it or you know, couldn't get yeah. an accommodation or being seen as um, problematic. Um, and in many settings um, amongst ourselves, we would set these things up. We would, you know, like for autistic women and non-binary networks, for example, AWN Network, we've, since our inception, we've had, we have all of our meetings virtually. Um, we usually have them um, where, where it's um, typing to communicate only, you know, not speech. And so that it's, yeah, it's, you know, equitable for everyone. And these are things that we've done. It used to be something that made me happy that if there was a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting, and there was also a virtual option, it's like, great. Eight people might be in the room, but maybe three of us are calling in. It used to be great. It used to be nice. It used to be, you know, something that gave me a breather, gave me a chance to kind of, you know, re renew myself. But now everything has gone digital, and it's gone digital in a way that's not accessible. It's not gone digital the way we would do it. It's gone digital the way that the neurotypical person would do it. You've taken a lot of your bad meeting practices for face-to-face -face meetings and dumped them into the virtual setting, which as a result has made what was once a comfortable setting for us um, less comfortable, more cumbersome, more burdensome, um, crappy, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Lee, do you have any anything specific to say about that? Well, I definitely agree with Marina Kay because um, I know a lot of people have come to me and said, you must be so happy that you know everything is digital now and we can have Zoom meetings. But I definitely agree that it's just taking the way that non-autistic people do things and just making them virtual so it's not accessible to us, even though normally like digital communication is very accessible to a lot of autistic people. And like part of that is like meetings where we don't have closed captioning. I, it's, I'm going to be a lot slower to respond because I need the text to really process what is being said. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I have found that it is not accessible at all. Yeah. Even though like it's taking a tool that we use and we, and we use it in a way that makes things like a lot easier for us. And then you're just taking the tool and doing it completely differently. So it's no longer accessible. <laughs> yeah. And I can say from my own experience, it it's definitely catered toward us neurotypicals. I still find it challenging in a lot of ways, um, like having to look at the pictures for a long time and know that I'm on a video and, you know, there's glitches that happen and, you know, hiccups in the, connection and it's so like the nervous system does have to work harder to keep up with these you know cues through a screen like as adults obviously you can probably uh determine what your needs are better you know any of us could determine what our needs are better as adults do you think that um your needs uh as far as this sort of accessibility would have been different when you were children and are your needs different than your own children now as far as you know communicating in this way do you want to i'm sorry do you want to start lee um sure um i think my needs are basically the same but i've adapted a lot of um i guess i have a lot of skills where i've adapted so i can like function a yeah. little better <laughs> but um I do know that when I was when I was younger, I would not have been able to express what my needs were because mm -hmm. I I just that's how my brain works, and it's really hard to explain that to someone because you just you assume that that's what everyone is like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But when someone would say like a thing, when I was a kid, I would say that the fluorescent lights hurt and they were really loud, and adults would say that I was you know, I was just trying to make an excuse to get out of school and kind of gaslighting me a little bit. So then I also stopped saying that and I thought there was something wrong with me, you know, <laughs> a 
like maybe I was making it up and it wasn't until I was an adult and I was like, well, oh, this is real. This is really happening to me. And I could express that that was like an ex that Tina has, but I can't have for us. And that's not really a virtual thing, but like, yeah. <laughs> that's just an example. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I do think it's easier to express what my needs are now and it's easier for me to find coping mechanisms now than when I was younger. But it's really hard, and I see it with a lot of kids that um, I work with at the library. That they they know they know what they need, but they can't express it in a way that to make the adults around them understand it. Yeah, and that's really hard. Yeah. And as far as the access needs with my um, autistic son and I, um, we have a lot of similar ones, and we also have some conflicting ones. But I'd say for the most part, we're pretty similar. So. Yeah. <laughs> And Marenike, same question to you. Yeah, sorry. So I'm trying to get on with the computer, but I'll, I'm at least I have the makeup done. And my hair is not sticking up on top of my head, so um, <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> I think so. We I think really mentioned um, kind of something what, what I would want to say that I think that my needs were very similar when I was young, but my needs were seen as you know. It, it seemed like, oh, you're just trying to get out of something, or you just don't like this, or this is ridiculous. How could that hurt? How could that sound? No one can hear that buzzing of the air conditioner. Nobody, the light, oh, everyone's eyes adjust to it. Or no one this. So it's kind of like, um, you know, technology uses when I was younger, you know, I'm an Xennial, so, you know, I've been around for a minute, I'm going to say my age, but, um, <laughs> but I'm not young, not old, you know, just there. But when in school, when we use technology, um, the room, the computer room was always like freezing, you know, because people needed to keep, that's when we had the big towers and the monitors needed to keep the computer room cold. So anytime you had a computer processing class, typing class, whatever, you were going into a room that's like significantly colder the temperature, temperature than the other room. And I remember one particular year in school, um, it was in a, what we call a temporary building. So it wasn't inside the main brick and mortar building, but kind of like a trailer type of building that was being utilized um, for, you know, to give additional space to the campus. And, you know, so those, so in those buildings, you didn't have central air conditioning, but you had the type, the window unit type. So not only is it really cold, it's really loud. And yeah. so, um, and there was one that would drip on the outside a little um, when you would come in and you had to walk on this kind of ramp thing. And so, and, and sometimes the wind would blow and it, the dripping would get in your face. So, you know, I would mention this and, you know, like when I was trying to get into the classroom, the teacher would want everyone to hurry up and get in. And I would try to time my walking in the door so that the thing wouldn't fly in my face. Um, and I tried to sit in a place where when the air conditioning would turn on and off, that the chime wouldn't like irritate me. And so me wanting to get to certain seats was considered problematic. And so I think it's just that kind of like what Lee said, that a lot of the same things that we felt or needed, needed things, I needed things to be given to me in writing because I processed them better. Auditory processing for me is just crap. Mm -hmm. um, story time when teachers would read aloud was horrible. So giving you something that I can read and maybe see, you know, or maybe maybe I don't need to see, but I can read it. Or w Those are all things that would have been helpful, but I didn't have the agency as a child to request those things. Now as an adult, you know, people provide them maybe because they don't want a lawsuit, you know, because of the ADA or whatever, but um, I I've noticed that as well. Um, with my kids, so, um, Two of my kids are autistic, the others aren't, but they all are, um, you know, you know, d disabled. They all have various different, you know, their neurology is pretty unique, e each and every one of them. And so I have some, I have one child that likes the video, um, the, the sensory input of, you know, videos and um, all of that. And I have another that's extremely nervous. It's, it's very, very um, difficult to use. And um, another that doesn't mind the viewing of the video, but the talking aspect is hard. So. Um, we found that like right now I'm in my living room because of the fact that I'm on a, you know, a video call and I was on a couple right before this. So as to not overwhelm the children with all of the noise, you know, um, I need to be elsewhere because for some of them it's bothersome. There's definitely a, a neurotypical um, kind of, uh, why can I think of the word that I want? Basically neurotypicals need to be aware that like just because we don't perceive something doesn't mean that you don't. And that the thing that I think a lot of neurotypical people also assume is that just because something is technology, it must be accessible. Um, that's obviously not the case. It, it's not the same thing for someone who's using like their leisure activity and something that gives them autonomy 
to then ask them to like start doing activities, even in some of the apps, um, you know, that like school districts are using for virtual learning, you know, okay, great, it's an app, but there might be no, um, no visuals and no uh, written instructions. And, you know, those are all things that, that would benefit everyone, but that some people need. And, you know, that's kind of like a missing piece that I've seen. Um, well, so, I know, I go ahead. I didn't interrupt, but when you were saying before that you were like looking for the word, I was thinking empathy, which is something that often yeah. autistic people are told that we don't have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it, I think it's Dr. Damian Milton who dubbed the double empathy problem um, he's an autistic researcher and it's totally true that, you know, we neurotypicals, um, like, you know, all the old paradigm of thinking that autistic people don't have empathy. And obviously it's still pervasive in some groups, you know, uh, but we don't know, you know, like we can't pretend that we know your experience. And so, um, I'm glad that we can like talk about this because it's so important in having respectful relationships with each other and, you know, realizing that um, like the burden should not be on autistic people. It needs to be like, you know, a two way street. Mm -hmm. So what sort of accommodations we've talked about, like written instructions and things like that. Do you think there are other things that would like help make these interactions easier? Do you want to go, Miranda Kay? So I have a whole list of stuff that I could give. So <laughs> first of all, um, when people, um, when there's going to be a virtual meeting, a Zoom meeting or WebEx or whatever, um, Google Meets or whatever people are using, um, please, people still need to send an agenda or at least what the meeting's about. A lot of times people just set up a meeting and you don't even know why the heck there's a meeting. Maybe they hint about why in the title, but I'm like, okay, so if this was a meeting in a conference room, you certainly wouldn't tell somebody to drive across town and not know why they're meeting. Right. I know why we're meeting, <laughs> you know, um, can I get some advance notice? Um, can you set it up to where I can save the meeting in my Google calendar? Because a lot of times Zoom and some of these things don't sync properly and I don't use Outlook. Um, I don't use the iCalendar. And so um, you send it and it's for a certain time, but I can't click and it saves in that time. So now I'm supposed to, with my executive functioning, find a way to go in, create a message, copy paste your thing and, and send it. Um, can, um, you know, there's no clarification about if somebody's going to be, um, I guess, in charge of uh, operating the chat function. So there are a number of meetings that I'm on where I might just communicate through chat the whole time or part of the time. There's no one um, in real time looking at the chat, addressing it, um, reading it to the others. Um, another thing that is problematic is um, the, you know, typically when before these were the norm, when those of us would do these virtual meetings, we would have a time where you could kind of connect five minutes before so you could get your audio out of the way. Neurotypicals don't do that. Just connect right at the hour. So now you've got to hear your echoing, your weirdness. Everyone's got to tell you you're muted. And so you waste five minutes with you all trying to learn the technology because you don't use it. And the rest of us are sitting here and it's a sensory nightmare for us to hear this echoing or whatever, you don't know who's the host or everybody's waiting for everybody to join and that's anxiety inducing for us. Um, um, as Lee mentioned, captioning is often not provided or there's not a transcript offered later on. Like a lot of people send you the video, but they won't send you the transcript or they want an, and or the chat um, transcript as well, which is challenging. Um, there's, it's not clear who to reach out to if you, you know, is it the host or is it, you know, some kind of call, you know, like person, like it's not always given, um, it's not always clear. The, the features are not universal. So sometimes there's a QA and a function, sometimes there's not. Sometimes it's Q and A and chat. Sometimes you can change your view or move the speakers around. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can unmute yourself. Sometimes you cannot. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things. Um, neurotypicals like to spend like five to seven minutes of the start of the meeting on small talk, but don't put that in the agenda. Because if I know you're gonna do that, I'll just call in at, at five after or seven after. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how boring this is and how this is annoying. And I don't wanna catch up with you. I may not like you. <laughs> so like, um, so that, that, I think that that's unfair. Um, I think that some meetings they require you to like they'll say everyone must have their camera on you know one of my daughter's classes did that and mm -hmm. i understand wanting to make sure people weren't i guess on social media playing around but for some of us that's really 
um, for me, I can do a lot better um, if I have the video off and if I'm chatting. Like so, or I can have the video on, but I'm chatting. Or it depends, or I might do back and forth. But to be forced, you must have your video on the whole time and you must um, talk. That may not work, you know, for everyone. Yeah. And um, so those are just a few of the things I think that people could do um, to make it more accessible. And um, certain things don't need a Zoom call for. Certain things you can email, get address and be done or a Google Doc or something. Don't right. make little things. It's some, at a certain point, it feels like being held hostage um, for another way to, for people to try to just, you know, keep you captive in their view to make sure, because again, they have this need for this face-to-face -face interaction. So it doesn't matter what you need or your abilities. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Lee? Well, I think Veronica covered like all of the things I was thinking. <laughs> and um, I would say one thing I would add is the small talk thing is I've been in Zoom meetings um, where, you know, you introduce yourself and then they give you a question that's like really open-ended. Like one time, it was, tell us something interesting about yourself. And I panicked because I don't know, like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> and, I, and the whole time I was the last person to like answer the question. And the whole time I didn't listen to anyone else because I was panicking about, am I going to say something inappropriate? It's maybe oh. too interesting or it's going to be like really boring and that's not interesting enough. And I... It was just, oh, <laughs> so those little <laughs> icebreaker games, um, I don't, I don't think that they're very accessible. <laughs> Honestly, I don't like them either. And I don't really know why anyone really thinks they're a good idea. <laughs> um, so I just thought of something. Oh yeah, go ahead. So I know before we started, we were talking about um, like the names. So depending on the platform you use, sometimes if you already have an account or whatever, like an email account, it might save your name. Sometimes you type in a name or you have to type in a name and an email address. And so I know one thing that in the autistic community, sometimes we um, we may put initials or a first name. We may not put the full name. Sometimes we'll put a name and like our pronouns or whatever, but it mm -hmm. seems like it's a lot more, whether it's a business or social, it's a lot more formal with non-autistic people in terms of like, so mine automatically types in my name and pronouns because I have it set that way in my settings. But usually I'm just typing Marenna K. My name's long enough. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry there's not another Marenna K on this call. You know, so it's like <laughs> the fact that a lot of people want you to put first and last name and affiliation um, is not accessible because sometimes we don't really know what affiliation we're there for. Am I here on behalf of this organization? You know, or am I here on behalf of me, the person, like just as an individual or what, you know? Um, we all don't work in this field, you know, it's like our life. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, too, that um, my neurotypical daughter has very hard time staying on Zoom for a long time for school. She gets severe headaches. Um, you know, it's a lot. So I think, like, generally to have, like, a universally designed sort of plan so that, you know, we're not putting these... Um, extra stresses on people like we need to be aware that people are going to have different needs and we, we should really be trying to meet those needs and not just like doing a one size fits all same you know for these as well as in everyday life um and i know like even for myself i've noticed so like if i'm on zoom and i'm like looking at the screen of our pictures but I'm also trying to look at the camera because I know that that's kind of what looks best or whatever. Mm -hmm. I do find it, it's like half the time I'm like, wait, what was just said? And I <laughs> I almost like can't keep track as well. And so it really reminds me even with, you know, the what? forcing of eye contact. And I just want you to know that like, I've really been like thinking a lot about that. And, you know, I've always like tried to be as considerate as I can, but it's it's like helping me in a lot of ways to be more like thoughtful about how I um, can be better. You I'm know. really glad you said that. Oh, Lee, I'm sorry, you're ready to talk? Go for it. No. Okay. No. Oh, okay. no. All right. just... so, see, that's another thing. We never know the queuing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know it's with everybody, but with us, it's just uh, autism people. It's just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> we can never know. Okay, what did we pause an appropriate amount of seconds before you? <laughs> this kind of stuff. But, you know, I, it's interesting. Like, so for me, um, one thing that I've liked about these virtual meetings is, I despise eye contact. And because of these, the virtual meetings, it, people can think, get a sense that you're kind of giving them eye contact, but you're not. Like me, I'm typically looking at myself because I want to make sure that one of my, you know, locks. Yeah, like, yeah, you want to look good. Out of my nose or something 
Okay. So, um, or if my kids are running around, I'm like, okay, can they see? Oh, okay, he's shorter than the couch. Good. You know, whatever. <laughs> like, so, um, um, so for me, I find, wow, this must be really helpful for the neurotypicals. They must feel like they're really connecting with me because it, it, it's, it's pseudo eye contact. I mean, even if it's not perfect, it's more than they'd get if they were with me in person. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I found. <laughs> Another thing, one thing that I've liked about it, because like I know we've talked about what's challenging is, so with, I feel that the virtual meetings allow you to see a part of a neurotypical um, colleague or whatever that you typically would not see in their, in a, in a boardroom or in a meeting setting or in an office, you don't get like, when you see when someone's home office with their pictures or their kids or their cat or the floral design or whatever, that kind of, it makes it, to me, it makes it less it gives me a, a sense of more of a sense of comfort on this call that, okay, you know, such and such is not as intimidating or stuffy or whatever as I thought, you know, cool. Or their kid's interrupting just like mine does or whatever. Um, one thing I have noticed is that I think uh, it's gotten better, but prior to the pandemic, so people of color, you know what I mean? Like we need different lighting, you know? So sometimes these meetings, I'm like, okay, um, hmm. The lighting sucks. <laughs> the background, you know, you don't want to go in a certain place because, you know, again, fluorescences are difficult, so I use natural lighting. But I'm like, okay, you were acquiring or you want to be strongly recommended. Everybody's video be on. Hmm, I look weird. I, you can see my eyes and teeth and nothing else. Or I look sallow or weird in this lighting or whatever. I'm not white. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, is there any, you know, you know, thought given to the fact that some of us, you know what I mean? It's just, or, is somebody using a slow internet or using their phone only? There's certain features that you can only use if people are like, okay, I'm gonna share the screen, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And it may not be you know, something you could access on the mobile feature. So they could have easily emailed the agenda and you could still look at it, but no, they have to pull it up on the screen. That's the only way you can look at it. No, they're not sending the link. And so it's kind of like, sorry, I started talking about positive, you see I already jumped back into the negative. No, it's okay. Yeah, let me stop there. Yeah. No, it's all good. Um, we are coming up on uh, about a half hour, which I know we talked about not going too long so that we could try to keep this accessible, right? Um, so is there anything else that uh, you guys would want to add? Like, what about, you know, do you have any suggestions, like, as if you could talk to like parents of like younger kids who are going to be supporting their kids through virtual school right now? Um, do you have any like advice for how we can make sure that they're supported and still get access you know to the learning materials that they need that might they may not be able to get you know live through a screen um i think well i i actually talked i was going to talk about this anyway and i asked my son for permission and he gave me permission to discuss our experience with homeschooling because we actually were homeschoolers for a long time before the pandemic. And then um, when he entered high school, we did a part-time homeschooling and part-time um, in-person classes at the high school. So then when we went to the, um, you know, we went to virtual, we thought it would be easy because we had been doing online, you know, stuff for school before that. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, you know, it's like a video that you watch with closed captioning and it gives you a schedule daily of tasks to fulfill so you can stay on track and you know you don't have to do them that day you can like catch up and you don't want to get too far behind but it's like very helpful and if you have a question you email the teacher and we thought it would be like that but it was not like that it was like a google classroom and we live in a rural area where we have very limited internet but we just actually um had some work done so that it's not as bad as it was before but he couldn't join a google classroom even if it was accessible to him because he, we just didn't have the access to the internet like um, <clears throat> other kids because of where we live. And there was no captioning. Um, there's none of the um, accommodations that he would need in a regular classroom, like a schedule, like an agenda yeah. type yeah. thing. And, um, you know, written, a written, his teachers at the high school were really good about giving him um, written notes of what they were going to talk about so he could follow it. And that didn't happen in a virtual classroom. So we didn't do the virtual classroom and we, our district offered us um, packets that they mailed us. And um, you could go and like email your teacher for instruction, but the, all the teachers emailed like pretty good instructions. And it just kind of was like to catch up with what they had missed. And it wasn't as like, 
as rigorous as like an in-person you know thing right but at this time i really don't feel that's necessary anyway so yeah like, it, there's these kids have enough on their plate they're pretty mm-hmm. stressed out so you know just take it slow and if in an ideal world i would say let's just push back school until it's safe because i i don't think it's i i think that that would be healthier mentally for kids to just yeah. push it back and just like let them take this time they could learn in their own way maybe do some unschooling which we did for a long time very successfully but um i like the the mail in packets because he it was like a light work but it was you know it was challenging too because he had to like work and send it back into his teacher he got feedback and it was much much more accessible than the online school for him yeah <laughs> So that would be my alternative if you're not just going to push it back completely, maybe do some like mail and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of times that's how they may be working more anyway. You know, in, in normal times, my daughter's younger, so they use more like tangible items and things like that. You know, that might be what really they need more than, you know, doing things through a computer. Yeah. I have a couple of things to share also. I think Lee made amazing points um, about it. And so I think that one thing that would be key is first, (coughs) districts, teachers, whomever, whether it's Google Classroom, whether it's Edmodo, um, Blackboard, whatever you're using, Moodle, first, make sure that there's just not some weird administrator only settings. Um, There were some settings for like one of my sons, for example, was in high school um, where you could you could only access the material from a computer. Well, I have five kids living at home. We don't have five computers for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, needs to use it, but they didn't want, I don't know if they didn't want cheating. So he literally could not get on. I had to, the teacher couldn't lift it. There had to be someone in IT and, you know, everyone's telecommuting to get this done. It took almost a week before he could even get on. Um, I couldn't give him my computer. I have a job I have to do too. I mean, I could give it to him periodically, but not during the hours that he needed. There were also certain things, certain hours that you couldn't access things. So I think that people, and, and the captioning was atrocious when it was available. Um, so that was problematic from the administrator side. I think that it would be good for people to look into, you know, maybe um, try, don't lock into a particular type of learning management system just because they gave you district a discount or what have you. Yeah. And um, as Lee mentioned, having a, a distinct schedule like you would have in another setting, obviously this is an emergency situation, but scheduling is important. Things and having multimodal learning is important too. So don't have where there's only a video which tells what they need to do, and then they still need to go and click more videos. Have it also in, in writing. And then if you're using outside links, make sure they work, make sure they have access to the right way to log in or the right password. Do they need to be logged in through while they're still in the learning management system or outside of it? Are there certain browsers they need to be using? If you don't have fast internet, kind of like Lee was saying, we have our situations pretty similar, our internet sucks, um, Make you know, be, accommodate for that. Um, attach documents and allow people to turn things in in more than one way. Don't just attach a whole bunch of PDFs because some people don't have, a, we don't have a working printer. Our printer works when it wants to work. <laughs> and so um, everyone can't, you know, print something, write it out or whatever, and then scan it back in. Some things need to be, t- you know, people need to have the ability to type it. Um, another thing that I'd recommend for parents, if, if there's a way to make like a parent account, make one. If there isn't, use your child's account. Go in and play around and, and look at it and learn it yourself because if your child might get frustrated and if you don't understand it all either, you're going to get frustrated and everybody's, you know, now you've got, this is due this day, you logged in, it's not working, this isn't happening, you made message the teacher or your email, but you haven't heard back, it's just really stressful. So if you can kind of have an idea of the way it works somewhat yourself so that you are, you know, able to provide more support, um, I think that would be good. And then, like Lisa, said, I really think, ideally, I, I think, frankly, the children should have been from March to now. I think we should have just not had school. I think, frankly, they should, they should have just had like almost a year off, you know, and started in 2021. Yeah psychologically, all kinds of different ways. I think that really this is just great inflation and just, you know, it's just, you know, a way to keep the status quo. I don't think it's um, emotionally healthy nor, you know, best for people's, you know, um, different intellectual, you know, you know, types of cognition, you know, and, and, you know, abilities to do things the way we're doing them now. Um, But if that's not an option, then I think that people just need to kind of chill. Like I, I, I am a lot more loose about things than I would, than I am during the school year like you know so if they're if they're you know i'm not going to press them to spend the same amount of time on a computer or reading a book or doing this or doing that you know i'm a lot more lenient about things not being done at this time or how you know making sure they have time for you know video games or you know fun stuff and 
I am a lot more um, proactive about advocating for my kid when they haven't done something on time and I'll turn it in. Yes, he didn't get this, but also this link didn't work or whatever, you know, like emailing for support. And so I feel like it gives me um, more of a voice to support my child because of the fact that, you know, there's just, and then also it'd be nice if there were ways to make comments or ask questions that everyone in the class can't see. You know, if people would make sure that the, the private and the teacher only or whatever functions or features. And then if there's some, some things like just a, just a room where it's just a message board where people are just chatting for socialization, if you have the option to like mute or, you know, hide or remove that, that's nice. So maybe you don't care. <laughs> so. And don't need all of those notifications like distracting you, mm -hmm. you know, from what you're trying to do. Um, this was all so wonderful to hear from both of you. I'm so excited that we are gonna get together again um, we hope that we're going to continue to um, put out more webinars and um, thank you both so much for being here and I'm so happy to know you both. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.